thanks a lot and thanks so much for inviting me here i've spent many an uh, hour or day in this house um through my various incarnations in activism and government and other places so it's nice to be back and it's nice to be back at the conference uh -huh. and my speech is there which is quite reassuring um and i think it is really important that i think back to this issue and that's the kind of main piece here is um i really want to make sure that the climate movement um, which is a sprawling and mutating and changing thing, links up much more strongly with the democracy, governance, and other spaces. It does not need to reinvent wheels. It has a bit of a habit of reinventing wheels. Um, it's kind of reinventing development at the moment. Some of that is good. It's innovative, but some of it is also wasteful, um, and there's not enough people to go around. So um, I'd love to follow up. Um, after this with any ideas you have because we would like to build a stronger collective of thinking around this area so we can work together better. Um, I'm going to speak for a bit, do a few slidos, make some provocations and suggestions and then we probably have time for Q&A at the end. I think we've got 45 minutes so I will kick off. Um, it's not very focused. Can someone, does it feel focused to you? It feels a bit blurry from where I am. Okay. Anyway, so I mean, if, if someone can have a go, it would be good. Um, so just my background, so as well as um, in kind of overview, I worked at WWF um, looking at community conservation globally, which was a real stark introduction to the realities of managing resources um, in many parts of the world. And now I took that to the Foreign Office where I was seconded and set up an environmental democracy fund, which was an experience, um, and worked a lot on the Aarhus Convention and setting up a rather short-lived global partnership trying to introduce environmental democracy globally. Um, Prime Minister's unit works on a range of things from conflict to climate to corruption to organised crime and UK fisheries, which brought all of those issues together into one very exciting space. And if you want me to bore you about the joys of um, the intersection of organised crime, corruption and fishing, I'm sure some people here do it. It, is, it was, again, a very instructive um, understanding what regulation and governance really means in a really world. I used to have police protection when I went around to fishing villages. So that was kind of like, it was quite spicy. Um, and at E3G, since we set it up, we do a lot of political economy work. We've analysed over 35 countries and really dug into um, how things work. And I, I gave a speech on this, which um, you can also look up online in the future. But on the core of things I want to say today, even if they're blurry, are, you know, there's a lot of discussion about technology at climate change, but it's um, democratic values, not always electoral democracy, but democratic values, institutional strengthening, governance, innovation at the heart if we want to win it. And we don't talk about enough, but we also don't talk about enough the threat of climate change to our democratic systems, which is actually why we set up E3G. It wasn't because we were trying to save the planet, is we were trying to save the kind of thin grain of international law and national law from the turbulence you would get with uncontrolled climate change which means it's not enough to follow the science, which is a very common thing people in climate say, because science doesn't tell you how to rewire human decision-making. It gives you no guidance on that. In fact, sometimes it's positively unhelpful because it makes things sound like they're inevitable. And I think that, that's where we get back into the issues of rights and control and devolution, and accountability, all the things you do every day. But also, and I think this is, yeah, I know Simon Sharp for a long time, and I often use the word complex, but I don't, it is one of the problems we have. Yeah, it is complex and overwhelming. I've been talking to climate diplomats for the last six months, and the big word is overwhelming in the richest countries. I am overwhelmed by what you expect me to do. I don't disagree with what you expect me to do, but it's overwhelming. So part of this is also not just saying it's really complex, you've got to do something. How do we construct ways of working and thinking and spreading the burden so it feels less overwhelming, even to people who look like they have power, but actually um, not as clear. So that's about reforming governance systems for this climate change world. And I think that's, you know, again, I'd back to my sector, this technocratic focus, a stakeholderism, which is the classic, you know, we will consult. And if you look at the Glasgow Settlement COP26, it says, we will consult youth and indigenous people. There's not a single mention of parliamentarians and legislators. The people who will deliver this change for their people are their elected representatives. It is good to talk to people, but we've also got to use and change our mainstream systems if we want to make a real difference. So I'm going to go through four main things. One, um, 
about the retreat of environmental democracy and the dynamics of climate politics. Some of this you know about, but I just want to draw a few issues. Um, why we think environmental democracy is mission critical for solving climate change, um, why you need to have this underpinning. And to be honest, it's actually what we said at the beginning. It's about making mistakes. We are going to make a lot of mistakes trying to do this ridiculously large project. Without legitimacy and feedback loops, we will never course correct or be able to survive those mistakes without losing public support. And we'll get into that. So in a way, this is the classic example of the kind of Soros proposition of, you know, know you're going to fail and work out a system that's resilient politically to the fact you're going to make mistakes. But then also, and that's what I said at the beginning, it's an opportunity to build alliances around good governance have much bigger positive externalities. Solving for cl climate change is a huge political mobilize that's opened up systems for change that have been locked down for 30, 40 years. It is the 500, 1,000 ton gorilla in the room. Let's use it to do lots of things. We need it to solve climate change, but there's no reason that we have to do one thing at once. And actually, the coalitions we need need to have lots of objectives. So we work a lot on energy efficiency with fuel poverty campaigners, old age campaigners, children's health campaigners, um, economic interests. Why? Because they all want the same thing. So let's build a big coalition. And that's really powerful. And, but again, it's not just winning one-off battles. It's actually changing the fundamental systems. And so often I get told, what policies do you promote? And it's like, I don't do policy change. I do institutional change and structural change and cultural change. Because if we're trying to change each policy once at, one at a time, too slow. We need the systems to be much better at making policy decisions inside their own form. And again, that's part of our evolution as a movement. Oh, sorry, the animation. So this is what most people think climate politics looks like. This is a, the opener for Kyoto, a new play at the Royal Shakespeare Company about the Kyoto climate negotiations in 97, which was my first climate conference. And this is meant to be Don Perlman, who was a cigar smoking, and I don't know why he hasn't got a cigar, cigar smoking Texan lobbyist funded by the petroleum industry who controlled the talks at Kyoto working with the oil states. Don was a real character and a very not nice man. And it's very hard to find photos of him because I was trying to find a real photo of him, but he has very little presence. Um, and that's what people think. This is all owned by the fossil industry. It's all about the fossil industry, beating the fossil industry. And I spent my time doing lots of things to beat the fossil industry. So my first slide I thought is, who do you think owns all the fossil? Is it transnational corporations with Don? Is it pension investment funds, which means you? Is it OECD, rich country governments, or is it non-OECD country governments? Who, who actually has a stake in the climate changing economy? Okay, Alex. I'm sure it's going to come up with the answer on the screen. Um, okay, how many have we got at the moment? 13. A few more, a few. Okay, that's, that's quite represented. I think we settled down there. Pension investment funds, OECD country governments, non-OECD country governments, transnational corporations. You are around 75% wrong. In fact, um, pension investment funds, total exposure to global fossils around 1 trillion, which is around 7% of their exposure to global real estate, which is exposed to global climate change in quite a big way. So if we... Can I go back to my slides and if it, this works? Who does own the money? Who, it's developing country governments by a long way, except for the US, which we'll come back to. Saudi, Kuwait, UAE, Iran, Iraq, Russia, Libya, in terms of oil, gas, Russia, Middle East, Iran, some of the stands. Most, and these are, this means it owns as in they own it and they get all the profit. They tax the profit out. Um, lots of multinational companies do the pumping, do the exploration, and they earn decent money, depending on what they can negotiate. But fundamentally, the asset owners are a small group of mainly authoritarian 
and this is not a coincidence, developing country governments. So when people say we want to get fossil out of the UN climate system, you can't because those fossil owners sit at the table because it's the UN and their countries. So and that is just the reality and it's not, you know. So Don was important, Don was a big mover. What he was really doing was organizing OPEC. But OPEC doesn't need Don to organize them anymore. OPEC is quite capable of organizing itself against what it sees as an existential threat. So that's the, the reality of this. But the flip side and the good side of that is a lot of people aren't tied to the fossil economy. So the majority of the world's economy is not connected to those fossil reserves and the majority of global investment and companies aren't. So in terms of building a coalition for change, we have a few people who will lose big in Saudi and elsewhere, but a lot of other people who are gonna gain out of the transition and that's good politics. So the question is how do we make that coalition work? Um, and one of the themes of this will be how's our tactics to move forward? Where are the emissions? So at the moment, this is a bit old, but I put it up anyway. Each blob's a country. Um, liberal democracies, this is around 2017, 31% of CO2. You, India, of course, can bounce around on these kind of tables, as you know. But basically, there's an awful lot of emissions not in open political systems, and the open political systems are going down. So if you look, this has been complicated over time, but basically, um, the advanced economies are reducing emissions, unsurprisingly developing countries are increasing emissions, and because of the alignment of the political systems, you end up with more and more emissions over time being in much more restricted spaces. And as the European election showed, the green wave, the school strikes, that kind of civic mobilization, which was really powerful in driving European action, is not available as a tactic in lots of other places. So as the focus of climate action is like 70 or 80% of Lean investment has to be outside the OECD over the next 20 years. Um, moves to places that are much harder to work in. We need to think much more imaginatively of how to do it. So there are tactics that have definitely worked in developed countries and more open economies, which may or may not work. But again, it requires us to think imaginatively and not rely, think that there's some kind of magic youth movement that's going to come and save us globally. Um, I have staff in India. I have staff not in China for, good, for very good reasons that we work with China a lot. Um, we have to be extraordinarily careful what we say on public spaces, just like many of you, um, about things like coal power stations, which you wouldn't think was politically sensitive, but I can tell you one of our main partners in Vietnam is in jail who works on coal power, and that is not one incident. That's one of many incidents we work with. Um, which comes to this, there's, you know, environmental defenders are the most at danger of um, human rights activists. It is mainly associated with land rights issues, which will get much worse because land and water rights issues are the two things massively under stress in a climate change world. But what it doesn't show is the much broader set of repressions around demonstration, around environmental activism everywhere. So um, it is a very restricted and very violent space and will only get worse. And so a lot of, and this, work gets very little spot. When I was in the Foreign Office, I spent a lot of time, in fact, I met Global Witness first time, getting Global Witness out of jail in Southeast Asia, but I'd never heard of them when I was at WWF. Because they weren't, they, but you know, getting them out of jail repeatedly was quite important for the Foreign Office. But there isn't a lot of, and that's one of the reasons we set up an environmental democracy fund. But there isn't a lot of support for this kind of work anymore, moving forward. But it is gonna be more and more, um, this kind of development conflicts increase. But then again, some of these are going to be over critical minerals mines to support EVs. Because all of the critical minerals tend to sit in the most fragile frontier landscapes. So again, it's not just about evil them against good us. It's going to be how do we balance the costs and benefits of the transition when we need to build really, really fast. And building really, really fast is hard We're maintaining equity and permissions. And that's a dilemma we need to embrace or it will embrace us. Um, and lastly, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of attacking going on. Um, I did this before the Russian war because Putin was, the first job I got in government was doing an energy strategy against Putin. It's like 2003. It's known he's going to do this for a long time. But, you know, undermining of democratic norms and spaces by deliberate information operations. I know you do a lot of work on this, you know, it's Analysis we've seen suggests 70% of the traffic from the Gilets Jaunes movement was Russian bots, 
We're seeing an awful lot of work in Africa and elsewhere, um, kind of anti-climate pro-fossil work by Chinese and Russian information operations. It's quite active at the moment. You talked about repression, but also kind of hard and soft corruption. I've got Steve Bannon there, because even though Putin's a big boy, Bannon's network behind the scenes, again, it's, it's not about... He doesn't really care about climate change, but he sees climate change as part of the nexus he's trying to defeat. So a lot of the reason why the hard right in Europe takes an anti-climate stance, which is not an interest-based issue, is a culture issue that Bannon's pushing through his networks behind the scenes. Um, and so whereas the climate movement has built a bit of anti-disinformation and opposition capability, um, it's not really keeping up with the effort now going in from some of the big forces who are starting to realize that we might win. For years, they never thought we would win. They thought we were irrelevant. But now, global emissions has probably peaked this year. Oil demand projections are all going down. Gas demand projections are all going down. Every percentage point of that is trillions of dollars for one of those countries and some of those companies. So we expect to see a lot more money flowing into active opposition as opposed to in the past kind of passive work. So, and... The Koch brothers are our favorite version of that. So that's, uh, that's the kind of dark side. But the good side is that um, people think we should do something. This is the best survey I've found to date with the worst graphics. So if someone wants to take the data and make better graphics, please do it. Because the color scales on the two sides are not consistent. So green and red do not mean the same thing. It's tiny at the bottom. But it's 130,000 people. And basically, that's red is 60% in this. So it's pretty good. So <laughs> Basically, everywhere thinks their government should do more to fight climate change. That's not bad. This is actually more interesting, but here, red is 46%. So we can't really read the same, but it's still, everything's pretty green, which is about 50%. So a majority of people say, not only do they think other people should do more, and that they would pay 1% of their income to solve climate change, which is an important result in another graph, but they don't think other people agree with them. But the numbers show other people do agree with them. So one of these issues, and it's very pertinent for you, is visibility of agency. So the reason we set up London Climate Action Week was to show people how many other people like them were fighting climate change in London and through its networks, because we realized everybody thought they were alone. So that issue of visibility to create power and agency is super important. And again, it comes back to the fundamental political issue here. The opposition is narrow, focused, entangled, and rich. The people who want to solve climate change are broad, unorganized, fragmented, but there's many, many more of them, much more wealth in that space than the other space. So fundamentally, climate politics and solving this issue at one level is a matter of organization and visibility, which sounds like something you might be quite good at in terms of the things you do. And I've got to stop on America because a lot of things you read in the newspaper about climate are put through the lens of the US and do not reflect that global picture because the US is the only major economy, and this might be because it has lots of oil companies and a really bad political system, where we've seen a divergence of political opinion over climate change over time. So more fragmentation. Everywhere else, it's pretty bipartisan except for the fringes. But in the US, you've seen if you Democratic, Republican voters um, diverging on this issue. And it's probably the most divisive issue in the whole of us beyond like gun control is up with gun control and abortion um despite america being massively fragile um but it's also interesting from our point of view because people often talk about this number it's 114 million those horrible oil companies spend on lobbying on capitol hill and we only spend 30 million say the ngos american philanthropy spends 9.2 billion in the u.s on climate activities so again, this is not a David versus Goliath issue. We have huge amounts of resources on our side. Why are we getting less out of our 9.2 than they get out of their 114, would be the question for me. And for me, a lot of that is because we're not spending it politically, we're spending it technically, or stakeholdery, or communications -y. We're not building foundations for change. And I think that's where, and you'll see a similar pattern, not quite as extreme, because America is an extreme space, but again, if you read anything by an American journalist about climate politics, just, just say, that's, that's nice for America, but it does not reflect what's going on in the rest of the world where we do not have this split and these huge lobbies, different things going on, particularly state entanglement. So that's kind of the landscape of politics. Moving on to what's going on. 
Um, what's really going on is climate impacts are happening faster, harder, and more dangerously, and we're nearer system limits than we ever thought. When I started, people thought safe was around four degrees. Now safe is around two degrees. Um, but that's just the scientists getting better at science. It's nobody's fault, but it means, in practical terms, we thought we had three generations of infrastructure turnover to get to a zero carbon economy. We now have no generations in the rich world and kind of one and a little bit in developing countries, a bit more in Africa. In China, they need to take down around a trillion in fossil assets they've invested in already. That is, again, not because anybody was acting slowly, even though we have acted slowly, but because the scientific estimation of danger has changed. And in the end, all the politics of climate change come down to this slide and how much risk we're prepared to take. Because fundamentally, we need to act relative to the climate system, which is not a human system. It just does what it does. Um, if we work too slow, it changes. We can't do anything about it. That is very different to human politics, where you generally get another go at things unless you have a big war. And that's why pace and scale of change is the most important piece, because the slower we act, the more risk we take. And to be honest, we do not know, and the scientists do not know, where these tipping points are. So it's a political judgment. So the question is, who's making that political judgment on what basis? And I can tell you, virtually no country has made that judgment at a kind of serious, um, we're going to resist the invasion of Ukraine by Russia type of level. I work a lot with national security councils around the world. And the Chinese at the moment are kind of thinking two and a half degrees might work for them because they've got so much coal. So there is a real, and I had this conversation with Chinese decision makers. So this is, this is one of the big issues. But the good side is, because you often get democracies are too slow, we're too slow. Actually, it's the democracies who are reducing emissions relative to GDP. So absolutely reducing emissions, including what they export, import from China. So the other line on that is the green line is consumption emissions. Um, so democracies have shown they can deliver and keep the public on side mainly. China now has per capita emissions higher than the EU, despite being much poorer will meet historically emissions two years' time, but also has the world's fastest renewables sector, and that's the China paradox. So no one's acting fast enough, but we have got places, things are going fast enough. They are places with quite tricky and difficult democracies. Doesn't mean the future, they can do all the things they need to do in the future. It's not just repeating, you know, it's easy to build the odd windmill, it's hard to change your agriculture system. It's a different thing. But it does give hope that there is no fundamental thing where people say, oh, democracy is a short term. That is just not true. It depends how the democracy works, how it thinks of time. I know lots of autocracies who are extraordinarily short termists, whether they're private sector autocracies or public sector autocracies. So again, there's a lot of lazy tropes out there. And that's why we think back, and if most of you have probably seen this, the Rio Principle 10, which is about access to information, participation in decision-making, public awareness, and judicial administrative proceedings is such a powerful tool. This is agreed by every country in the world in 1992. It's embodied in the Aarhus Convention and in lots of laws. And it's a real foundation which, you know, I think the environment movement needs to go back to, to drive these worlds. So what can we do about it? So if we don't need to kind of a safe level at 1.5 degrees, take that as a, as a thing, we need to change all of the energy, industrial, transport, infrastructure, and agriculture systems in all countries in the next two decades, fundamentally to something they don't do now. So that's the task on a practical level. 95% um, of the global economy is covered saying it's going to do that in some time frame, somewhere between 2050 and 2070 for India, 2060 for China, 2050 for most of the rich countries. But when you look, if you look online and look for analysis, you go, okay, people can tell you precisely how many gigawatts of solar that needs, precisely how many wind turbines, how many electric vehicles, but you will not find a thing saying, what, what do I need to deliver that in governance terms? Who needs to be involved in participating for that enormous change that has to happen so fast in every country at every income range? You'll find virtually nothing. And that's the challenge we need to do um, because a lot of these systems are controlled by very small groups of incumbents. And to be honest, most politics doesn't care about how the power systems run. It just wants it to turn on. It occasionally cares about it. So a lot of these systems, like the financial system, have been sitting there unstudied for quite a long time. 
So there's got lots of quirks and non-democratic spaces and tra untransparencies around, which we're finding out. But essentially, and it's back to the point, if the reforms don't just have to produce better governance, they have to produce governance that can do this pace of change, responsive, adaptive, innovative, and public interest focused. And we are going to fail, and we don't know what we're doing. I mean, really, really do not know what we're doing. We're kind of saying, we're going to meet that target, and then we'll work out how we're going to get there. It's not that we've got a great plan in the back. And that, that reflexivity, and how do we keep people on side during that? And it does come back to yours. If we can't make good decisions about now, because our decision-making systems aren't there, how the hell are we going to make good decisions about the future? But again, for me, that's an opportunity, because it means there's a real opportunity to build a bigger coalition for change, and we'll come back to that. And it is more about building than blocking. And this is, you know, I started my life in the environment movement when we were playing, most of our time was stopping stuff. Stop cutting down that forest, stop depleting that fishery, stop doing that mangrove. That is not the task. There is still blocking to do. We've got to the point where five years ago there were around 250 power st coal power stations we built globally. Now outside China there's virtually none. Global campaign, bottom up, grassroots, very dangerous, really successful. But the only reason they are blocked still is because people see renewable energy coming in to take the space in places like India, Indonesia, Vietnam. And that requires us to build fast and win fast, not win slow, because that's losing. So examples from our work you know, about you know, the effort we have to put in. It took us 15 years to change how Europe planned its gas pipelines and its grids, which were controlled by some arm's length bodies. I feel bad for having made people work for 15 years on that regulation with their partners, but it's, that's a kind of entrenched and institutional change you have to do. It took years of freedom of information work in Europe, and I'm using Europe because it's kind of good governance, but it's still hard to work in, um, to work out that all of their models were underpricing the value of energy efficiency and overvaluing the role of fossil energy. And even the head of the DG Enner did not know that until we confronted him with it. And he just suddenly realized everything he'd said publicly was based on a misapprehension of what his models were telling him. But again, sometimes politics lies deep in these technical systems, and you have to flush it out, as you know. And one closer at home, um, UK has probably more top resilience engineers, practitioners, people who understand climate adaptation, climate science, anywhere else in the world per capita. Most of our critical infrastructure is massively vulnerable. And we keep on building more vulnerable infrastructure. And Parliament keeps on calling this out and the government keeps on doing nothing, which is a good example. Why? Because there's no public lobby for better infrastructure, and the Treasury doesn't want to spend any money. So that's a good example. You have as much information as you like, as many parliamentary reports as one last year to do that. But again, we've got tools to do it. We've got, and you can go on the, the link there, so a database of climate laws. There is a lot of law out there to use, and there are a lot of independent commissions, like the Climate Change Commission, in, are now in over 20 countries. South Africa, Nigeria has one, European Union has one. So we're starting to build blocks of law, litigation. There's a whole Climate Action Week. There'll be a litigation conference. We're monitoring litigation around the world on climate change, climate change committee. So we are putting building blocks in place. It's a bit scattergun, but it is moving forward. But one of the arguments we're starting to make is that better governance helps you win the low carbon race. And that's the thing. So you start to get, again, don't think all the economic forces are against this. Most of the companies in most of the world want to see fast rollout of clean tech because that's good for them but they're really bad at changing and building governance. <laughs> they're quite good at their micro lobbying. But again, anybody who thinks corporates are good at lobbying should lobby against them. They're just, on this positive work, on the building work, they are not good. So I think that's, and that issue is, it's not about you know the campaigning of blocking and building coalitions for building are so different. I think that's where some of your technology and building outside our sector is so important. And just a bit more data, this is corruption um, on the, Y-axis, democracy on the X, but just goes to show a lot of, in the center ground, a lot of those emissions are in countries with high perceptions of corruption. But, and again, but it's just because a country isn't taking money to make bad decisions doesn't mean it doesn't make bad decisions, as you know. So that's, you know, it, but it is true that again, more and more of the infrastructure choices that need to be made are in countries with high levels of corruption. So that's the kind of why we need better governance to solve it. But we also need it to keep the public on side. Um, yes, going to net, net zero will cost around 1% of GDP. We spend around 40 to 60% of GDP on public services. It's a rounding error, and it's going down. 
And so that's not the problem. It's not the absolute cost. It's who wins and who loses. Who's protected, who pays, who's consulted, and who's involved in decision making. You know, that's why you know, there's so much fuss about coal miners. A tiny group of people in Europe, huge political resonance. We work a lot on coal mining just transitions in Poland, Czechia, Germany. Um, we're going to ask people to change consumption patterns quite soon. What they eat, how they travel, how they heat their homes. Those are much more than you know, what's behind the, the switch on the wall. And as climate impacts increase, they will be weaponized. So in Spain, the far right is using lack of response to heat waves and the, a portion of water as a source of conflict, just like we see in other countries. So this issue of how do we build a social contract for transition? So the people who will have to change, and there will be a lot of change, even if it's not a lot of cost, feel that this is worthwhile and that they're getting a fair deal. And that gets me your second slide, which is there have been a lot of reporting in the press about backlashes plural, against European climate legislation or in Europe. What do you think is the main reason? Um, overall drop in priority on climate action, people don't care as much, green waves gone, fossil fuel lobbying information, disinformation, public perceptions that it's unfair, the policies themselves, or weaponization by parties, our good old friend Mr. Bannon, um, his ideological ones. Such a good audience at Slido. So fast. Usually it's a kind of the general kerfuffle to find one's phone. Uh, 35. That's interesting. This time, I would say you're virtually 75% right. Um, the main thing is, it's really not general care about climate action. In all of these cases, it's much more specific. And people tend to judge the policy based on its immediate costs and benefits and how they perceive them rather than the overall, and this is, we're learning, we're doing, a, we're doing currently a playbook on backlash because we're learning this at the time. But at the moment, on um, the, particularly, so the mixture of, in Germany, their heat pump rollout was a really bad policy run by a guy I've known for long years, and you should talk to his party colleagues about what they think of him, but it was super weaponized by other people, and that weaponization of mistakes is the thing I worry about most, and the ideology behind that. On the uh, Dutch nature laws, there was a lot of big meat behind that. And so there are fossil fuel disinformation campaigns. But generally, like in the UK, they tried to push hydrogen, so we kept boilers. They've been, they slowed things down when they've had a receptive government audience, but they've generally failed um, in terms of but the, the political parties, the ideological cultural war space is much more enduring and worrying because if politicians see an advantage in pushing something, especially if you know, the policy is not very good, and lots of policies aren't very good, they're moving forward. So that's, but again, that's in our gift in a way, because that means we can design policies that aren't so vulnerable and build that social contract and build across parties and make parties not see the value. So one of the big fights, sorry, can you take that down? One of the big fights um, in the European elections was to stop the European People's Party, which is a conservative bloc, centre-right bloc, tacking towards an anti-green position, which some of their leadership wanted to do, um, and undermining van der Leyen. And that was a very successful campaign in which our Prime Minister of the UK played a really good part because when he trashed net zero and got no bounce in the poll, we went around to every politician in Europe going, look what Rishi did. It didn't work. <laughs> so there's a lot of politicians looking at other politicians going, oh, can I play this game? And so again, one of the, you'll see a lot of spin around the European elections trying to win that battle. Um, actually going to go through that because we want a lot of time. So the last one is, is on resilience. So um, you'd think people care about climate risk. This is a set of countries which we did deep political mapping in, and the blobs are different types of interests, so energy, technology. The green ones are how much objectively they are at risk. So Philippines is very high at risk, UK less at risk. And the depth of color is how mature their debate is about that issue. So Brazil, climate change, massive issue in terms of risk very little public debate. Um, same in Italy, um, Vietnam, Germany. These are countries where we are vulnerable should be a large part of the politics, but it's not on the table. Um, and the Slido, I'd have asked you who's well protected. Well, Bangladesh and Barbados are much more prepared than um, either the UK or Germany or the US or Pakistan. 
it's not, it, governance is important. People often say, oh, we haven't got the wealth to be well governed. Well, actually, a lot of this stuff is not expensive. It's just good organization. And a lot of rich countries are very vulnerable because there's no right to compensation. So in this country, the policy, as I found out when I did fisheries policy and tried to compensate fishermen, I was told by the Treasury, compensation for climate damage is not allowed. Not even discouraged, not allowed, unless you're very rich and can lobby really hard. And that's true in virtually every country, that there is no loss and damage right for people. So that's a pretty rough social contract. You, know, you do nothing about it. You lose all your asset value in your field or your fish or whatever, and you get no money. Um, there's no transparency of climate risk data in lots of places, sometimes for national security reasons, sometimes it's really hard to get. You try finding out how at risk you are beyond flood, which they do a good job in this country. It's very hard. And climate impacted groups don't organize, and there's no one to talk in government. So there's a big latent force there, but how is that organized to actually change the outcome? And that's a really good example of where actually technology and digital tools could do a lot. Because how much risk do I face? is a question that's really hard to ask, because that's what you need if you're gonna to start to organize. Because in the end, you need to balance that, the fossil side and the non-fossil side. And then I'll finish here, we talked about this now. So the, that's why all of those reasons the climate community needs to be better at governance. But again, those huge majorities that want climate action are now huge majorities that want better governance. How do we tame that latent support and turn it into support for better rewiring of the system so we can make, make better choices? And I think that's a huge opportunity because, and this is just my personal experience, you say to someone in a country, you know, there's corruption or there's kind of, you know, dodgy deals, cost, things are going to cost large infrastructure 10 to 15% more, and they're kind of going, well, that's just how the world is. You say we're going to build the wrong city, the wrong energy system, which you're going to have to take down and rebuild, which is what happens with climate if you build the wrong things. They're a lot more upset. So there's a narrative to be built, a set of evidence to be built about why just allowing kind of incompetence to carry on as a norm normality is not good enough. And I don't think we've made that case. And that's why we keep on building the wrong things. And that, which means it's particularly on the resilience side, I think it's easier on the mitigation, on the reducing emissions side, it's more visible and there's more of an architecture. But on the resilience side, which is the reality we're all going to live with for the next thousand years. It's not going away, we reduce emissions to zero, we will still have a very climate change world. It'll take three to 500 years for that to come down, maybe more. And a good example of it is finance. In finance, we have already got a position where it's mandatory to release your environment risks. Um, it's mandatory in this country soon to have transition plans for each firm. You have taxonomies that mean you can't be greenwashed when you buy a green product. There's been more change in the financial system in the last 10 years due to climate change than there has been due to the financial crisis. And that's why the American financial system is pushing back against it so strong, if you might see that in the newspapers. So there's, yeah, as, we, as we drive change to solve climate change, it's huge, we always need to, and there's huge opportunities to make change. Um, and I'll leave this up. So there's a few ideas which we're playing with on things like super committees for infrastructure in putting the principles of environmental democracy into all of the target processes the UN is now mandating. Um, independent oversights. One of the ones I would like is a legal right to know your risk, which I think would be very powerful. So people can say, I, I have a right to know what you, I am being exposed to, both by what's happening in the climate, but also how little I'm being protected by my government, because that would set up that dynamic. Um, so I hope that's been a good mixture of pessimism and optimism. People have been accusing me of being optimistic recently in terms of outcomes. I am quite optimistic because I've seen 30 years of change, but the next stage of climate is gonna be harder in terms of having to drive these deep changes in governance and choice in much larger number of countries and much deeper set of places we worked in the past. But again, as I say, I think that's an enormous opportunity for us to work in different coalitions. So thanks very much and some Q and A, I think. Thank you so much, Nick. I think uh, I've been told by the person whose job it is to make sure Nick gets to the places he goes to that we have to let him go pretty quickly. So I think we've got time. Well, I've got a board meeting. Two, two or three questions. And um, the top one coming in on Slido so far is maybe a follow up from your final slide. So what do you think is the most impactful change that civic tech can help with at this point? I think the risk one is one of the ones I've put in the top. 
I also think if we could, and it, it's sort of something that you're trying to do at the moment, is tracking promises and changes made at the local level. I am also an advisor to Sadiq Khan. I'm a, a part of his Sustainable Development Commission. He has said London should be net zero by 2030. Nothing is happening to do that. And it makes me significantly upset. And But how would you find as a Londoner that out? Because London's got such a crazy governance system. So I think trying to make those spaces where I'm all for politicians being ambitious, but they need to deliver. Because if we don't deliver, cynicism will set in, apathy will set in. And that's what's going to kill us. What's going to kill us is that's what you said is that. So I think civic tech kind of providing the tools where people can kind of keep on keeping on in the politics of delivery, which is very different to the politics of target making, because you can do marches and that's all fun. The grinding process of delivery is much harder and that's where civic tech could be super important. Okay. Um, next question, isn't it a bit hypocritical to shift the blame on developing or authoritarian countries when all they're doing is feeding the demands of greedy Western economies? There is only facts, not blame in this game. Everybody has used carbon, everybody's using carbon. There are lots of responsibilities we have to help all of the countries who suffer from climate change to move on. And also to help countries, poorest countries in the world spend so much money on oil imports, it kills their economies, moving them to clean energy is just the best development choice, but it's really hard for them to get investment. So that's a lot of what we work on is trying to essentially make the new economy fairer because the old economy has so much unfairness baked into it. Um, but I'm not going to apologize for pointing at authoritarian countries who I know are undermining and trying to lock up my friends in other places activists. And that's where there is, luckily, they all hate each other so much. Um, they find it hard to form a rogues alliance. That's my biggest worry about Trump too, is he might actually put some structure. He tried in Trump 1 to put structure on oil producing nations to break apart the UN process and attack activists everywhere. So um, I think this will come a little bit to choosing size, not based on how much carbon people have done, because as I say consumers and producers, it's not a blame game, but more on what they're doing to move to the new world. And are they prepared to um, participate or are they pushing back? Next one, I think is gonna be a really quick one. Are you happy to share the slides afterwards? Mm. No, slides definitely, I, I, someone says, who's really profiting off the industry? Definitely those countries. You see whether who's who built their oil revenues over the Ukraine. So we have a war in Ukraine, oil prices go up, Saudi and UAE are very much in the cash now, as is Norway. So most of the money from oil exports, unless you're an exploited African country, which they, some of those are with the high costs, goes in resource rents to countries, which it should do. That is the right answer. It shouldn't go to the companies. It's always a negotiation. But no, they're very good at getting the money out of their fossil. They're not naive. They hire other multinational corporations to negotiate with the multinational corporations to make sure they maximize their revenues. Um, next one coming up on Slido, and then maybe we'll see if there's a question in the room. Uh, how about the sentiments from the global majority towards the legacy of Western imperial and colonial powers? Democracy versus authoritarian narratives doesn't really address that kind of history. Yeah, and that's why we don't use it, why we kind of fold it into a much more about responsive governance, because, yeah, and we didn't like the kind of whole Biden democracy autocracy thing. And there's a place for that, which is more in the hard security realm and dealing with attacks on human rights. But on the transition, as I say, you know, blame isn't going to help anybody because there's plenty of it to go around all over the place. There are a set of responsibilities and working with people. One of the things I do worry about is when I started, it was quite fine to call out developing countries for how they were treating their citizens and the fact that they weren't doing the right thing. And this whole anti-colonial rhetoric has moved us to a point where that's considered not allowed. And that goes against me. We're a very universalist organization. We think you know these things are universal and we feel it undermines our partners in those countries who are fighting on the front lines if Northern groups don't call out bad practice in other countries in conversation with the with the networks they're in but that seems to be something that is more charged and disputed now than it was perhaps 10 or 15 years ago i think that i think that's a good point why why is this time different i'd say there's two why is it not kind of colonial or post-colonial commercial exploitation and why isn't it just useless aid that didn't make a difference to my country which is another intervention from the from the west um i think we've got to prove that and so i say to all of the countries donor countries i work with is you start from a negative space 
you need to show you're serious about this, especially working in places like critical minerals and, air, and industry, that the balance of interest is you know, fair on both sides. And when you're talking about trade in EVs, for example, the trade war with China, um, so I think there is a lot of suspicion on both sides. There's also a lot of interest on both sides. That's actually one of the core parts of our work. And one of the interesting areas we think is mining. And we think the UK could be well positioned to come up with model mining agreements to try and broker some of those spaces. As you know, what's going on at the moment is purely transactional on both sides between the elites in OECD countries and the elites in developing countries. It is not what a development friendly set of mining and hydrogen and other agreements would look like. So yeah, the I think that is is the space. If we're gonna make it make people feel that there is a fair enough but social contract across countries not just within countries we need to get that right which means a lot of introspection we're not doing about how our institutions come across and how they work together but that it is a live conversation and it is a live information operation from china and russia but i'm not sure it's as live a solutions conversation as i would like one definitely one for the new uk government i would say Maybe on that note, we'll draw a close to this part of the session. Thank you so much, Nick, for setting the agenda of where we are now. Thank you so much.